It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here is Douglas Coleman. Hey there, hi there, ho there. You're as welcome as can be. Oh no, that's a different show. Hello, it's Douglas Coleman. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. How are you? How are you? Thank you for joining us. We got a full show today, two interviews plus music, so not a lot of time for the intro. Uh, My first guest is Corey Groshek, and Corey is an author, blogger, investor, musician, entertainer, consumer rights advocate, metaphysician, founder, CEO of Manifestation Machine. He would tell us all about all of those endeavors that he is into. He's recently written a book called Breaking Away, book one of the Rabalon series, and it's a children's book, which the characters are rabbits. He will be followed by actor-producer Tracy Birdsall. Tracy has been very busy this year. She recently completed a film called Rogue Warrior, Robot Fighter, which is a science fiction film. And she's currently working on a film called The Time War, which will probably be out in 2018 sometime. So she will tell us all about those films and a bit about herself. Before we get to our interviews, we've got music to play. We've got four songs. These are past guests of the Douglas Coleman Show. We've got four great tracks. First up is Berlin by Airport Impressions followed by Butterfly by Haley Loren, then Long Road by Greg White Jr., and last but certainly not least, Can't See My Life by Joe Gandy. So the music first, and then to the interviews. Calling in a conversation, falling somewhere downtown Berlin. Hang around behind the station, paralyzing observation. Stone throws away from me.
So ready to fold it all down So at home on the cold hard ground I'm not chasing the sun No more how I love that light But it don't help when the nights get long too tired to right all the wrongs I must have done to end up so far gone But my sweet friend, the angel You're floating on the wind Tell me, this is not the end And you say, you say, you say That I just gotta play this game And I'll leave it alive And someday, someday, someday I'll look back and see all the pain And fear was a lie You gotta die A butterfly Butterfly When it comes to change All I know is to rage against It don't matter the cage I'm in Still feels I go home to me, but then the rain comes down, and I'm afraid that I'll drown in here. Cover my hair, but it's loud and clear. There's only one way out, and oh. Out of all my shells I guess you know me well And you say, you say, you say That I just gotta play this game And I'll leave it alive And someday, someday, someday A Reaching for the wind Longing to begin again Butterfly Well, I've always had these dreams that are bigger than me A much bigger picture than I can't even see Like it's in before electricity Can I get there? Mm. Desire doesn't explain 
Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Okay, please welcome my guest, Corey Groshek. Hi, Corey, how are you? Hi, Douglas, I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, doing well, thank you. You wear a lot of hats. I was reading through your bio and you're all kinds of different people. So what I thought I would do is just kind of take them one at a time and you can explain uh, what it is that you do with those particular hats. All right. Sure. Okay. So first one, it says author blogger. So tell us a little yes. about that. Well, with regards to the author part, I actually just published my first children's book. It's a middle grade fiction book. So it's for around ages 9 through 12, although a lot of adults have seemed to like it as well. It's called Breaking Away, book one of the Rabalon series, like the word Babylon, but with an R instead of a B, because the characters, most of them anyway in my book, are rabbits. <laughs> um, I was a big fan of The Jungle Book when I was a kid, stories like Charlotte's Web and the like, and especially, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie about little dinosaurs. It's called The Land Before Time. I think it was from the late 80s. I was born in 83, by the way. Uh, so I loved stories like that where they used animals to teach children really valuable life lessons. So that's what I was attempting to do with this first book of mine, which, by the way, is available through Amazon as a Kindle ebook, as a paperback, and through Audible as an audiobook. As for the blogging part, I also run a personal growth and development blog called manifestationmachine.com, where I've dedicated my life basically to teaching people the same process that I'm attempting to teach children through my children's book for achieving health, wealth, success, abundance, prosperity, whatever you'd like to call it in their lives. Okay. Let me go back to your book a second, Breaking Away. You said it's uh, the characters are primarily rabbits? Correct. Okay. So what exactly do the rabbits do in the book? The book centers around two protagonists, a uh, female and a male rabbit named Rhea and Remy. The two rabbits grow up in a quite North Korea-like village known as Rabalon, <laughs> where rather rather than having a dictator like Kim Jong-un, they have a uh, big fat mayor named Monty Cottonsworth III. He's the third in a line of dictatorial rabbits who uh, basically have every other rabbit um, as their slaves. And the children, they're like me. And by the way, I have a twin brother. Uh, they're the rabbits that are the protagonists in my story are loosely based on me and my twin brother as we were growing up. We were very much into arts, things like poetry, music. We even did some drawing of comic books. Uh, so these rabbits are themselves into painting and poetry. And what they're really doing is dreaming of a better life. They want to break away from Rabalon, but like a lot of people, especially in America these days and really in all Western countries, they don't really know if it's possible for them. I see this a lot with millennials these days. They, you know, A lot of them saw their mother and father lose all their money back in 2009, and a lot of them don't know if a better life is possible or if it even exists. And so my book really centers around these bunnies finding or at least believing that a better life does exist and putting everything on the line to try to make it happen for themselves, which involves leaving their village and pursuing what they think is this better life on the other side of a big green hill, which on the other side of it, according to a story told to them by their grandfather, lies a mythical carrot paradise where there's more carrots than the eyes could see and really just freedom, abundance, prosperity everywhere. Is there a political message to this? I think... A lot of people would read my book and they would think that it's an allegory. I really leave it up to people who read it to determine that for themselves if they think it's supposed to be literal or allegorical. But um, I do have some strong beliefs about poverty in the world. And I would say that those beliefs, and some people might say they're political, do come across through the book. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to teach children is, for example, you could be born in a family that's impoverished isn't really doing well financially and maybe will never do well financially if you don't make some drastic changes in your life. But I'm teaching those children through this book that you don't have to live the rest of your life that way, that you can change it. And what my book, I believe, really instills in kids is a couple principles. Number one, dreaming big. Number two, taking risks, which is something all successful people do. Uh, number three, 
trust in your gut. That is listening to your gut when it says do this or don't do that because I've had a lot of cases in my life where I didn't listen to my gut and it um, had me end up in a lot of situations I, in hindsight, like to have not uh, dealt with. And number four, choosing faith over fear, which for me isn't about a religious faith, but choosing faith over fear with regards to going after what you don't want in life versus running away from what you don't want. And I think if those kids can get those four principles through this book, I think they're going to be off to a great start with regards to achieving success in their own lives. Well, I think it's a good message. I think a lot of people go through their life afraid, like you said, to take risks. You right. know, people play it safe, and at the end of the road, they look back and they say, you know, damn, I wish I had done this, I wish I had done that. And they don't come out with a fulfilled life at the end of it. So I think it's a good right. message. Yeah, and you got to start it young. To Right, learn. that's really why I wrote a children's book, Douglas. Uh, I could have written any book. In fact, I'm actually working on some personal growth and development books for adults right now. Um, one which is actually patterned after my own four-step process that I've used to achieve success and actually get to the point where I could write this book myself. But I chose to write a children's book because it's like you said, you need to reach these kids young. And based on some scientific and psychological studies and papers I've read or seen lately, it's a lot easier to get through to a child than it is to get through to an adult who maybe is too far gone, too jaded to even listen to what somebody like me has to say, let alone read a book about it. So that's why I went for the children. How's the book doing? Well, I will tell you right out the gate, when I released it in December of last year, I earned over $700 from sales. And from what I've read online, a lot of authors don't even make $500. So it's actually doing really well. Um, in addition, I've actually been taking paperback copies of the book and distributing them all over the state of Wisconsin, my home state, uh, through little free libraries. I don't know if you know what those are, Douglas. No. Uh, but... If your listeners want to check out littlefreelibrary.org, it's a charity organization where, and this started in Wisconsin, by the way, a, a child actually started this, where people basically build these little schoolhouse looking boxes on poles. A lot of them are really very nice looking, uh, where there would be books put inside of them. So it's like a little free library in your own neighborhood. I've got several within walking distance of my own house. But ever since I put my book out, I've been taking my books and just throwing them in libraries left and right, trying to get them to as many people as would like to read them as possible. And I have to tell you, I've gone back to a couple of the places, I've left them, and people are not bringing them back, which to me is a good thing. Okay, let's get to the second one, or the third one actually, is investor. And what kind of stuff are you investing in? Uh, well, primarily it's uh, the future of transportation or electronics is where I think it's going. It's uh, actually primarily in lithium, as in one of the main materials that we need to make lithium ion batteries, not just for things like our iPhones and our laptop computers, but also for electric vehicles, which are, I right. think, primed to really take over the world in the next 10 to 15 years. So I'm invested heavily, not just in lithium companies, uh, or I should say companies that use lithium in their batteries like Panasonic or companies that use those Panasonic batteries in their cars like Tesla Motors, for example, but actual lithium miners, as in the companies that pull the lithium out of the ground. So I'm heavily invested in that right now uh, because I, I really want to see what a lot of people want to see, a world where we're not dependent on oil anymore. Not that I want us to have to keep pulling lithium out of the ground either. I'd like to see us find something better than that eventually, but... I see lithium as a much better uh, way to power things than fossil fuels, in my own personal opinion. Oh, well, it's certainly cleaner. And I don't know the extraction process. Is lithium cheaper to harvest than oil? Actually, you know, I don't have numbers on that, but I it's definitely cleaner. And I think over the long term, it's definitely going to be less expensive. One of the big reasons I'm invested in the companies, I won't name them because I don't want to get in trouble with the SEC and sound like I'm advising <laughs> someone to buy this company or that. Right. Um, although if somebody looks me up on stock twits, it's like Twitter for investors under my name, Corey Groshek, I'm sure they'll figure out which stocks I like really quickly. Um, I do believe lithium is going to be a lot less expensive to get out of the ground. And I know that a couple companies in particular, um, SQM, uh, is one which is actually based out of Chile. They're actually looking into technology to make it less expensive, to get it not only out of hard rock, but also out of things like clay, 
which there's apparently a lot of in Nevada that isn't being utilized yet? Well, I think most of Nevada isn't being utilized yet. You can drive for hundreds of miles and there's nothing out there. <laughs> Just dirt. That's right. But yeah. right. And there there are a couple companies that own a lot of hectares of land in Nevada though that are actively looking at getting the lithium out of the clay that's in the ground right now. So if I would give any advice, not company specific advice, I would tell anyone interested in getting into lithium investing to look into the companies that are actually actively seeking to get it out of the clay in Nevada because I think those companies are really onto something. It's just speculative, you know, don't put your kids college fund in it necessarily, but if you've got a little money to play with and you feel like speculating, you know, maybe look into that and see where it leads you. So lithium they can make batteries out of and they can also make drugs with, yeah. Yeah, so lithium's actually I believe it's a mood enhancer. I'm not a big fan of the pharmaceutical industry as a whole, but I lithium's natural comes out of the ground and it does actually improve one's mood from what I've read about it. Yeah, in fact, they used to prescribe it years ago. I don't know if they do anymore, but they used to prescribe it for people who were uh, coming off of alcohol. Yes. You know, for alcoholics, they would give them that instead to try to wean them off. But I don't know if they still do that. That's back in the 70s. I remember that from uh, my father. Well, <laughs> he used to always have a I'd stash. Rather, I would eat some lithium before I'd ever uh, get back into drinking. I actually... For the record, I actually used to be an alcoholic, Douglas, and I actually beat alcoholism back in around the year 2008. Oh, good um, for you. Cleaned my life up a lot, and I'm happy to say that I'm 100% clean and sober these days, which also, in addition to my success-oriented process, I'll be, probably be talking to you about in a minute, uh, cleaning my life up, getting that alcohol out of my life, it's probably one of the things that had the greatest positive impacts on my ability to succeed. Yeah, people that have stopped drinking didn't realize how bad it was while they were drinking until after they finished drinking. Right. And then yeah, you they find look, out they're way more clear headed. Yeah. And then them. you you look back at it and go, what the hell was I doing? You know? Right. Oh, uh, it was a real mess. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like spending 20 years in that corporate environment. I did a little research on you and I know you spent a long time working for a company and not making music. And I found out that you're, you're now doing a lot more of what you like to do. And I, I'm a big fan of that. By the way, Douglas. Oh, well, thank you for uh, for looking me up. Yeah, it uh, took me a long time to get back to it, but I'm happy I got back to it. Better late oh, than too. never. All right, well, speaking of music, that's the next one on your uh, bio here. It says musician entertainer. So tell us about your musical endeavors. Sure. Well, I think I'll lump this in with another thing I told you I was into, which was making YouTube videos. Uh Back when I was around 11 or 12, I fell in love with hip-hop music, believe it or not. And starting at the age of 17, I actually started producing, recording, and performing music. And over the course of my life, I've probably done maybe 50 to 60 live shows all over the state of Wisconsin. I've worked with countless other hip-hop artists and producers in the state of Wisconsin. And by my last count, I actually recorded over 80 songs between 2001 and 2012, which is actually the last time I actively recorded music, really, for the sake of selling it or releasing it to the public. Uh, by the way, I actually just painstakingly over the last month or so took every single song I've ever recorded and I uploaded it online on SoundClick, SoundCloud, YouTube, you name it. If you look up my rap name alias, it's Corey Crush, that's C-O-R-Y, and then Crush, C-R-U-S-H, you can find my whole catalog. I'm not saying I'm proud of all the music I put out. Some is a lot better than some of the other songs I've done. But um, very proud to say that I, like you are doing right now, I dedicated myself to making music for many, many years. And I don't regret it for one minute. Didn't make a lot of money doing it, but I can tell you this much. I learned a lot about booking my own shows, working with other people, and really just giving people what they want, and, which is really happiness at the end of the day. Are you still doing it? I'm not actively making music, but I've been toying around with the idea of actually, believe it or not, putting out a kind of a personal growth and development themed album. I just don't know how well it would do. And right now I'm very busy writing a couple personal growth and development books for adults, so I don't really have the time to do music. But I'm still in love with music. I always will be whether or not I'm actually making it myself. Uh, let's see. We've got consumer rights advocate, metaphysician, and founder, CEO of Manifestation Machine. Let's see if we can do all three of those in about five minutes. 
Sure. Uh, well, to sum it up, I guess I should go back to where I was February of 2014. I was actually 30, going on 31 years old. Life basically wasn't what I'd hoped it would be. I was single, divorced actually. I was living paycheck to paycheck, stuck in a dead-end customer service call center job, sleeping on my retired father's couch in, in over $10,000 of debt, most of which came from credit cards. I didn't really see a light at the end of the tunnel back then. Uh, and then something really miraculous happened. I stumbled across a YouTube video, which was called something like, the metaphysical secret to success. And little did I know at the time that when I started watching this video, I was actually watching a docufilm called The Secret. Have you ever heard of it? No. Uh, the Secret, basically, if I had to sum it up, it's about a universal law. A lot of people call it the law of attraction, which basically says that we attract to ourselves that which we are in terms of the energy we give off. In other words, your life is a mirror in the people, places, things, and circumstances that surround you are a reflection of who you really are as a person or really how you feel about life in general. So if you're surrounded by a bunch of negative people, it probably means you're a negative person. On the flip side, if you're surrounded by positive people, you know, like most successful people are, you're probably a positive person and that's the vibe that you give off to people. Uh, specifically, one thing in this film hit me really hard, which was when a gentleman named Mike Dooley said, thoughts become things. What he meant by that is the thoughts you think actually condense over time into physical, as in cold, hard, physical reality, the things you actually see around you. Uh, so that was a big thing for me because up to that point, I was kind of thinking I was more like a lifeless log just being dragged along the river of life, just being bandied about all over the place, completely at the mercy of things I couldn't control. But what Mike Dooley said to me when he said thoughts become things is that I wasn't the victim of circumstances I thought I was. I was actually the master of my own destiny and that if I could change my thoughts, I could actually craft the life that I really, truly loved. Uh, since I heard that, I actually started creating my own process, which I call the four C's of success, uh, which, by the way, I just added a new post up at my blog, manifestationmachine.com, stating that I'm now offering to teach other people this process because I want other people to experience the freedom the abundance, the prosperity that I've been experiencing ever since I started putting what I learned from Mike Dooley and through my own four C's of success process and to uh, work for myself. Okay, tell us what the four C's are real quick. Well, without getting into too much detail, the first one is clarity. And the second is conviction. The third is compulsion. And the fourth is completion. To sum it up in a nutshell, basically you need to decide what you want, why you want it, wait for a compulsion to hit you with regards to what you should do. In other words, for the how to come to you with regards to what you need to do to get what you want. And then do that thing. Whatever that how is, just do it. Even if you don't necessarily know why you're supposed to be doing it or if it doesn't seem related to what it is you're trying to accomplish or won't get you there, you should do it anyway. And that's really what my process is all about. It's about trust, taking action, and being crystal clear on what you want and why you want it. Okay, fast forward to today. You said you were single. Are you remarried now? I am happily married. Uh, in addition, I, I will tell you this. I'm actually in the best place in my life I've ever been. And a couple of years ago, if you would have asked me if I'd ever get to the point where I'm talking to you, Douglas, I would have said you're crazy. Because now, after going through all that stuff I went through in the past, sleeping on my dad's couch, being in debt up to my eyeballs and whatnot, I'm actually completely financially independent right now, working from home. Like we talked about, I'm a published author. I run this personal growth and development brand manifestation machine. Uh, I've actually got a paid off house, two paid off cars, and I've got a personal net worth quite con contrary to where I used to have all that debt. I have a personal net worth of probably north of a quarter of a million dollars right oh, now. Good. So I'm doing pretty well, and I'd like to help other people do the same thing, which is why I'm here talking to you about the four C's of success. Okay. Well, if you want to find out more, where is the best place people can go to check you out? It's manifestationmachine.com. Otherwise, if somebody just Google searches me, Corey Groshek, uh, G-R-O-S-H-E-K, they'll have no problem finding me. Okay, super. Corey, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. It was very interesting. Best of luck to you. I oh, appreciate your time, Douglas. If you ever want me to come back on and talk more about this, just let me know. It's been a pleasure. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. 
Hi there, this is Stuart Epps from the UK, record producer, engineer. Uh, you might have heard of me. I've worked with artists from Elton John to Led Zeppelin to uh, Bad Company, Twisted Sister, Robbie Williams, Oasis, many, many great bands and artists in the past and the present and uh, hopefully in the future. But uh, you can work with me as well. You know, all you got to do is get in touch with me on epsmusicproductions.com. That's uh, E-double-P-S productionsmusic.com. Uh, and I can help you with your productions and with your recordings. Uh, a lot of people do home recordings now, which you can only take so far. Maybe they need a bit of professional help. So uh, get in touch with me and we can sort it out. And thanks for Douglas Coleman for giving me the spot. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Okay, please welcome Tracy Birdsall. Hi, Tracy. How are you? Hi, Douglas. I'm well, thank you. Uh, you are a familiar name. I work with, and obviously you work with too, with October Coast. Mm-hmm. And when I saw the email come through, I said, Tracy Birdsall, where do I remember that name? And it was about eight months ago that we had Tom Baldinger on. Ah. And from Who's Jenna, which you starred in. And we tried to get you to be a part of that interview, but I don't know, Tom didn't get a hold of you or you were busy or whatever, and it never worked out. So when I saw your name come through again, I said, oh, let's get her this time. <laughs> oh, that's funny because I don't remember ever hearing about that. He never uh, contacted you? No? I, I'm a busy girl, though. Well, yeah, it seems like it because you've got two films here on your sheet that I want to talk about. And they both look like they're 2017, so I think... Yeah, well, actually, Rogue Warrior came out just a couple of months ago, but the Time War will come out the beginning of next year. Okay, are you shooting that one now? We are. We were actually shooting until late last night, and we'll shoot again tomorrow. We're we're, we're at the tail end of it. We've actually been shooting it for a few years, but um, we're still doing, you know, additional shots, and it's just this huge, epic movie. And every time the director turns around, oh, my God, we've got to do this now. (laughs) like but it's awesome well i definitely want to talk about that one uh just Mm -hmm. a quick background it looks like according to your bio that you pretty much always wanted to be a performing artist yeah well i've pretty much always been a performing artist i mean i grew up you know mostly doing you know school theater and then that advanced and and um but i think i joined the union when i was 15 so yeah i've kind of always done this were your parents involved in uh, film or television or something? Not at all, but my uh, my great grandfather is Albert Lewis, who was the famous Disney, Disney composer from the the thirties, oh. and um, he had, he did a bunch of film scores and things too. And so, you know, it goes back. My my only connection goes back that far. But no, my parents actually wanted me to um, not be in the industry, and um, I just always felt that that was what I wanted to do. So they're very supportive now, but back in the day, not so much. Well, so was there anything else that you wanted to do or were you just headstrong to say, I'm going to be a performer, I'm going to be an actor, that's it? I kind of did the um, the acting thing, um, a little bit stealth mode. And um, so I, I went to college, you know, I only went a couple of years. I studied um, computer science and robotics. My father ran the largest power electronics convention in the world. So we were exposed to a lot of things really early on. And that's, you know, since I'm a big science fiction junkie, I was always just like completely excited by the robotics at the conventions. And and so I thought, well, if I were to ever, you know, use my my other side of my brain and do something, you know, totally cranial, it would be working in robotics. And, um, but I, but I never, I never finished that. I mean, I just kept working and I kept lining up gigs and stuff like that. So I was able to, to stick with my passion in life. Do you remember what your first acting job was? My first, um, professional job was actually a Sunkiss soda commercial. Uh-huh. And I did those for about 10 years. I don't remember it. <laughs> uh, it's on, it's on my YouTube. You should check it out. It's pretty funny because there's one when I'm 15 and then, you know, the good vibrations commercials. Sunkiss Soda, oh, and then okay. there's, yeah. there's another one when I'm 16, and I look like four years older than I did when I was 15. It was pretty funny. Okay, yeah, I will have to check that out. I remember the Good Vibrations bit. They used the uh, the Beach Boys song, you yeah? know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the song that played for those commercials. And, um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. So I watched Rogue Warrior, Robot Fighter, and mm-hmm. uh, it was pretty good. I liked it. Good. 
I was curious, though. It looked like you had mentioned you were doing filming in Nevada. It looked like some of the shots were done out there, yeah? You know, uh, I don't think we did any of Rogue Warrior out there. We've done some of the Time War. Um, I'm trying to think of which deserts we shot in because it's just that shoot went on for forever, too. But we did shoot out like off of Zizix Road and stuff like that for the Time War. Um, the other things were shot like Mojave, Salton Sea, oh, okay. um, yeah. you know, Yuma, Arizona, stuff like that. I, I thought I saw Death Valley in there at one point. Yeah, we might have gone over the border at part of that. You know, we were all over the place is the thing. One of the costumes that you wore, I had to ask you about. It looked like an old Victorian age corset. <laughs> is that actually what it was? No, it wasn't. It wasn't, you know, it, it was a modern corset, but it was made to look, you know, when, now that you know what her character is, that she didn't even know what her character is, then you kind of understand the costuming in it. People question the costuming, but then they understand when she has all of these realizations and they're like oh well that's why she's dressed like that you know what i mean and that's why as time goes by and she has those realizations then she kind of goes to the old tank top you know and it's kind of like okay that's not who i am i don't identify with that oh i see yeah because there was that white corset and then the black tank top and that was pretty much yeah. your outfit for the whole movie you know yeah yeah that was the bulk of it <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get involved in this particular film? Uh, who wrote it, actually? Well, Neil Johnson wrote and directed it. And um, a couple of years beforehand, you know, we both knew of each other's work. And we'd met up for lunch to talk about, you know, collaborating together and things. I was winning a bunch of awards at the time. And um, he didn't have anything coming up, but he had a couple of things in post. And I'd always wanted to go into the science fiction just because I absolutely adore science fiction. I grew up with it. And so we went to, to a lunch meeting one day, and he says, well, I don't have anything right now. He said, but I have this film in post. And he goes, would you want to be a spaceship computer voice and voice it for me? And I was so excited. Of course I want to be a spaceship computer. <laughs> I'd never done voiceover before except for my own ADR. So um, I did that, and then we just kind of stayed in touch and talked about um, – you know, doing a project where I, where I let it up for him. And that's kind of where Rogue Warrior came from. He went through a bunch of his scripts and he gave them to me to look through. And that was the one that resonated with me the most. And I think because it does deal with artificial intelligence and robotics. And um, then he rewrote it around both my character and some new ideas that he had. And that's where the project came from. I thought that um, Hoagland, I guess it was the name, was a great character. Mm. I really enjoyed Wasn't that. Wasn't he amazing? Yeah. I'll tell you, that was the hardest role to cast, even though it was a voice role, because Hoagland was so real to me. I mean, I interacted with this robot in my office for months before we shot, just so that, because I knew that if I didn't believe he was real, nobody else would believe he was real. And it even got to the point where when other people would read his lines off screen, it would take me out of that mindset. So I had to memorize a lot of Hoagland's dialogue, too, just so I could play it in my own head and not have to react to to um, the different personality of what I already created in my mind. And so when we were casting the Hoagland role, it was actually in post-production, and we went through over 3,000 voice auditions. It was just like, no, no, no. <laughs> People kept trying to do it like a robot, and we're like, look, no robots here. This is an actual personality. And then we, I swear we were ready to give up a couple of times and just settle on somebody, and then Tony Gibbons came across and he was, you know, here he had this British accent and this, and we never had pictured it that way, but he brought it to life. You know, his voice, he got it, and he just did a remarkable job. Well, it was reminiscent of C-3PO from Star oh, Wars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but not a copy. I mean, he was his own person, but it, it had a certain, that kind of neurotic quality <laughs> that and it was, it was fun because that was one of the things we were aiming for so much with the whole film is you know there's so many stereotypical type characters but we didn't want them to look like they were you know fashioned after any other character so we tried to make them all very original even though some of the ideas we've seen before we tried to bring originality to it so I think that was exactly what Tony did is he he made it his own character was that your first time having sex on a spaceship? God, I'd love to say no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just had to throw that in, you know. Because oh, it's really it's funny. funny. Yeah, and that was pretty closed quarters, too. It was one of those sets where they're like, okay, only, you know, 
only required personnel. It's a closed set. And it was so funny how many people showed up on set thinking that they were required personnel. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty funny. Well, it was actually kind of a surprise scene. I wasn't expecting it at all. And then mm -hmm. just like all of a sudden, boom, there you are. Yeah. And and it, and it kind of, you know, I think what it does is it, it was a short scene, but it just kind of gives you the mindset of, um, it was kind of to get you in touch with the mindset of the Skull Crusher character, really. And, um, you know, because of his, his brain conditioner. Oh, right. Yeah, because he was your boy. Extreme voice. emotions or anything. He was your boyfriend, right? And then you broke him yes. out of prison and you hadn't seen mm -hmm. him in a while. So, okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I know. I, I tried to make sense of it before. And then as, as an actor, you're just kind of like, okay, we're just doing this today. <laughs> I got to ask, is it difficult to do a, a scene like that in front of everybody? Well, you know, I've never done it before. I've always, you know, as I say to people when they say, oh, would you ever do this? Would you ever do that? Well, I think, you know, if the role calls for it and it isn't extraneous, it isn't, something it isn't gratuitous then you have to look at it and see what points are being brought across and then you're like okay i understand where that's that way and i also knew it was just from the back you know so um but it's really it's really it's quite it's quite difficult leading up to it but anytime that the camera is rolling i'm never questioning anything so once you you know once you've kind of signed on then you're like okay i'm just going to do this but um so it's difficult until the cameras roll i would say and when the cameras roll you're not thinking about it the anticipation is difficult, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that way with the action scenes, too. You know, you're looking at these mountains that are hundreds of feet up in the air, and you're like, okay. And you get up to the top, and you think it's going to be so difficult, but it's not when the cameras are rolling because you're not questioning it. You're just living it. And so everything is always, you know, bigger in anticipation than it is in, in actual, you know, in, in actually doing it. Did you do all your own stunt work, all the running and the the guns and all of that? Everything I did. Wow. It was exhausting, but it was a blast. I hope you filmed out there in the winter. You know, we did principal photography in the desert in the winter, which was three weeks out of, you know, the 80 days or so that, or so that we ended up shooting. But the pickup shots were all done, you know, off season. They were all done in the middle of the heat, the intense heat. And like the the one scene where she's fighting the round robots and she headbutts one at the end, that scene was shot in about 120 degrees and heavy costuming. And um, that was the only scene I actually passed out before I got to the truck. Oh, afterwards. Yeah, it was intense, but you just do it. You just drink a lot of water, <laughs> bring a lot of ice. So, okay, tell me about Time War, the Time War, as it's called. Mm -hmm. It looked really interesting. The premise, at least from what I could gather, you travel back in time and meet with Adolf Hitler. Well, Adolf Hitler is traveling through time in order to rewrite history um, in a very self-serving manner, at the same time to um, improve upon his genetics. So he's actually changing his own form through time. And Dion, which is my character, um, also does a lot of time traveling. And it's his father, but it's also his nemesis. So she goes through time and gathers various versions of herself and you know creates an army in order to take him down. And it's really... It's really a very, um, there's, a, there's a lot of, I, I always say this is a really twisted film. It has a lot of very dark elements to it. It's very serious. And um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not going to be for everybody, but for the people that, that it's for, they're going to just be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's, it's twisted. It's dark. You can, it's science fiction. It's drama. It's horror. It's, it's you know, psychological you know, there's so many different angles to it, and it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's just it's quite an amazing feat. Who's the producer on this one? Um, both Neil and I are producing it, so we've been, oh, okay. it's the first project we've worked together on. Um, it actually, we started this before Rogue Warrior, and um, did principal photography, and then the, the buyers wanted Rogue Warrior first, so we knocked that one out the door. And then it, we, we revisited this and we're like, oh, we have to make this bigger because now Rogue Warrior had gotten so big. So the the reshoots went on and on and on and the additional shooting and the storyline got intensified and we brought on other actors. And then we put it together. We had like this four and a half hour behemoth of a film. And then we realized we had to split it because we realized what we shot before Rogue Warrior and after Rogue Warrior was of such a different intensity. 
So what we shot before Rogue Warrior will later come out as a prequel after the Time War. Oh, okay. I'm trying to sort of make a comparison between a major Hollywood production and an indie film. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Rogue Warrior, Robot Fighter was somewhere in the middle. That's what we think too. Yeah, we're 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 we're, we're getting a lot bigger than than a lot of indie and um, and even with distribution, you know, we we got distributed by Sony this time, which was pretty amazing. But um, we do a lot with a little. I'll say that. In terms of budget, you mean, or in just in terms? Yeah. Of, yeah. In terms in terms of budget, but I mean that's how any profession is: is you you work your way up the ranks. You know, it's just that we keep trying to do something bigger and bigger and bigger, and we feel like your next film always has to be bigger than your last film. And um, the Time War is definitely going to be a lot bigger than Rogue Warrior, and Rogue Warrior was a lot bigger than it set out to be in the beginning. So, you know, it's just we just continue to to climb up that ladder. But you know, Neil's been—I think this is his fifteenth film now—and and, and um, yeah, I, I think that he's due for a big studio production. I really do because he's just extremely talented. Now, when you get a distribution deal with Sony, does that uh, necessarily mean? that your film will go into theaters or does it go straight to online Netflix? No, we actually started out with theatrical. So we were, we were limited theatrical. We came out on June 2nd, then June 6th, we had a 60 day exclusive deal with Walmart. So it was only available in, in Walmart stores um, in the U S and Canada for 60 days. And it sold out in two days. The physical media sold out in two days wow. and then they got it back in. And um, then 60 days after that, which would have been August 15th, then it went wide. So it's iTunes, Amazon, Amazon streaming, you know, streaming everywhere pretty much. And I, I know you can get it on Netflix DVD, but it's not in the Netflix queue yet as far as streaming. So you're currently working on time, The Time War. Mm -hmm. And when do you expect that to wrap? I'd say, um, well, wrap will be wrapped here within a couple of weeks. Um, post, then you have to go into post. Um, and so I'd say beginning to a few months, maybe a few months into 2018, which this is already, you know, the 10th month of 2017. So I'm thinking maybe five months, something like that. That sounds like something that I would be interested in watching. I like kind of weird movies. <laughs> it's it's really it's really it's really messed up. I'll tell you that, but but it's the type of thing I like to watch too. And I love to make the type of thing that I like to watch. You know, this movie's so complicated that I can only focus on one part one day at a time because my mind just gets confused. Oh, is this going to be one of those films that you have to watch three or four times before you get it? Well, you know, it's funny because Rogue Warrior, even people have to rewatch over, and you do pick up on things the second time. But this one's ten times more that way. You'll still enjoy it the first time, but you probably miss part of it. <laughs> it's like if Quentin Tarantino and James Cameron, all you know, got together and made a movie. Do you remember that movie Mulholland Drive? I do. I actually just downloaded it again on Netflix because I saw that it was leaving Netflix at the end of. Um, end of September. And I'm like, oh, I want to watch that again. <laughs> well, I watched it two or three times. And finally, I, I gave up and I had to go online to one of those sites that, that explains what the movie was about. Because I oh, just didn't funny. get it at all. But uh, yeah. hopefully yours won't be quite that complicated. You know, it, it, there, there are, you know, there are expose times in it, which, you know, in order to help you know, drag the viewer along if they get lost. But it's, it's more so of a you know, WTF, I can't believe they just did that over and over and over in the film. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, it sounds very interesting. Um, I guess my last question for you would be any roles that you haven't done yet that you want to do? You know, there's, there's only two roles I can think of that I haven't done. One is, is playing a mom. Nobody's ever in my entire life hired me to be a mom, which is hilarious. I've been a stepmom once, but, um, but, but that's not really something that I want to be. Um, cause I already am in real life, but I've never, you know, the only thing I can think of I haven't done after doing this film would be like a serial killer or something. I, I love things where I get to be dark because I, I take people off guard. You know what I mean? They, they think of me more as, as in who's Jenna, you know? So it's like, it's oh, kind yeah. of fun to, to do things that are shocking. Now I did a lot of things. I actually have a very dark side in part of the time war, but I'd say something extreme 
you know, like a serial killer or something or turning into a creature is the only thing I haven't done. Turning into a creature. You mean like the Hulk? I just, well, I don't know about that. I just like anything that's something I haven't done. For me, I'm inspired and excited by challenge. And um, to me, that's the most exciting thing as an actor is to be pushed to extremes. When you're looking at it, you're like, I don't know if I can do that. And then you have to decide and embrace how to do that. And to me, that's my favorite thing to do. Well, hopefully one of those roles will come along for you. I uh, would definitely be interested in watching you be a serial killer. <laughs> right? All right, Tracy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Best of luck with the Time War. Uh, I look forward to that coming out. Thank you. And best of luck with all of your other future projects. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's good chatting with you, and we'll talk again soon. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guests, Corey Groshek and Tracy Birdzo. This is Douglas Coleman saying goodbye. To the